Hi, I'm Laura Diener, guest host for Cybercrime Magazine. I'm here today with Omar Kawaja, Chief Information Security Officer at Highmark Health for an Ask the CISO segment sponsored by Fortinet. Thanks for joining me, Omar. Thanks for having me, Laura. It's a pleasure to be here. So you have such an interesting background. You went from being the head of product marketing for security solutions at Verizon for more than seven years to becoming the CISO at Highmark Health. How did you make the jump? You know, it was, uh, I got a email from a headhunter and the first thing I did when I saw the email and they wanted to talk to me about a CISO role is I sent it to my wife because it felt like it would be too good to be true. It didn't make any sense that I would be uh, being asked to, to be a CISO. And I sent it to my wife and I said, Nadia, can you look at this and tell me if this is legit or not? Because back then everyone didn't have a report phishing button and email. And so my report phishing button was to send it to my wife, who was the most paranoid person I could think of. Oh and she said, this feels really weird because you're clearly not someone could, that could take on this role, but you know, what's the harm? Give, give them a call. And I said, you know, there's no URL in here. They haven't asked me for my social or my credit card number yet. So what's the harm? And I called the person and um, we had a couple of conversations. I made sure to meet in very, very public spaces because I was <laughs> very, very skeptical the whole time. And um, at one point they said, well, my, uh, uh, our client is very interested in you for this role. And my response was, well, I don't think I am a traditional CISO candidate. I've not grown up in a security organization. I've really wow. been a service provider doing marketing and product management and some, some consulting. And he said, well, my client is looking for an unorthodox candidate. That's and amazing. I said, well, if they want unorthodox, <laughs> then I am definitely your man. <laughs> That's awesome. What a great story. Um, so tell us uh, about what you're responsible for at Highmark Health in terms of how many employees, the location, the size, and the scope of the technology infrastructure, um, plus the medical devices or anything else that you could tell us about your current role. Sure. So um, Highmark is... Uh, a healthcare organization. We've got several insurance companies. We're the Blue Cross Blue Shield for three different states. Oh, we have a reinsurance company as well and a dental insurance business called United Concordia Dental. Mm -hmm. And then we have about uh, nine hospitals. We're building four more, a few hundred physician offices and a technology company. Uh, all in all, we're about 40,000 employees spread um, across the U.S. and pretty much every, every state. And so my responsibility is to do whatever it takes to protect the information and information assets for for the organization. So that includes uh, what's in our data centers, that includes what's inside our, our hospitals. And so, of course, things like medical devices are becoming increasingly important, figuring out how uh, medical devices are only used for making patients healthier and not in making patients less healthy. Absolutely. Wow. That's a huge responsibility. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, so I have been reading about, I'm not in healthcare, but I have yeah. been reading a lot about um, healthcare being attacked more and more uh, from a cyber attack perspective. Um, so why do you think that is? <laughs> that, that's a good question. I, I think um, when it comes to ransomware attacks, the stat is that about half of all ransomware incidents happen in hospitals. And, and if we look at just that specific class of attack, the reason hospitals are perhaps being attacked disproportionately compared to any other industry mm. are probably that the information, the need for the information has a high level of urgency tied to it. So if I lock up your information and not give you access to your yes. own information, a lot of businesses can persevere for a day or two or maybe yes. even a week or two. But if you think about a hospital setting, if I don't have information as basic as the blood type or what dosage of chemotherapy I need to give this person or what allergies they have, it's uh, it's a pretty dire situation. Absolutely. So healthcare organizations have that sense of urgency to be able to to want to get over a security incident very very quickly, and uh, the threat actors understand that, and that's part of the reason that they are being attacked. The other is that healthcare organizations, particularly hospitals, have not spent a lot of time and effort and energy investing in security over the years, and so in some ways the infrastructure in, in healthcare organizations it tends to be the the low hanging low hanging fruit. So wow. they're also subject to 
uh, more opportunistic attacks. Wow. So capitalizing on that that human yeah. aspect of yeah. wanting to to just take care of it by any means necessary. Yeah. And, and you know the the other thing that's also interesting about a, a hospital, much more so than most other types of organizations, is that they are there's a lot of very sensitive information and sensitive technology, yes. and it also happens to be a very public space. So if you think about any other, any typical corporate building, Mm -hmm. you can have physical controls and you can have guards and you can have badge readers and you can define who can go where and you can manage that and maintain that through a system of roles and accesses. However, in a hospital, everybody kind of needs to be able to go to almost every single space within, within a hospital. That's one part of it. The other is over the last 15 years, there's been such an accelerated uh, set of innovations that are taking place in the healthcare space. So if we think about a corporate environment, whether it's a bank or it's a retailer or others, they may have 10 or 20 or 30 or 100 different types of devices, all of which are likely laptops and servers and maybe some printers and some scanners. But if you think about a healthcare environment, we literally have tens of thousands of different types of devices because every um, every month there's one more vendor that's coming out with a device that wow. used yeah. to be a quote unquote not smart device, but now it's a smart device because yes. it's connected to an information store. Yes. It may have the ability to call back home to its uh, cloud command and control center. And so while all of those are positive functionality, it turns out that that also increases the attack surface. Wow, that's amazing. You have your work cut out for you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. That was very insightful uh, in the field of, of healthcare, which again, I've, I've never had to... Uh, the privilege of entering into. <laughs> um, so Cybersecurity Ventures uh, predicts that a business will suffer a ransomware, you'd mentioned ransomware, so uh, suffer a ransomware attack every 14 seconds in 2019 and 11 seconds in uh, by 2021. Um, and ransomware has definitely impacted uh, healthcare providers with WannaCry was enormous. We had so much happen in the UK Um Hospitals, because of that, I read uh, a statistic about um, costing a hundred million pounds. Wow. Uh, WannaCry did for the UK hospitals. Wow. Um, and so, so how how do you defend? How do you protect against all of this? Sure. So, um, you know, it, it turns out that a lot of the basics that we think about in terms of security hygiene mm-hmm. become all the more important in the face of, uh, of this latest threat that really has been something that, that's come to the, the forefront over the last two to three years. Mm. And it is training people to not click on emails and open attachments that they can't, uh, they can't absolutely trust because typically that is the way that the ransomware makes its way into the environment and okay. then it spreads. Um, that's the way it comes in. The way it spreads is almost always because there's some kind of a vulnerability, yeah. typically at the operating system level, across other devices that then get infected. So making sure that your end users are trained on what to click on versus what not to click on and, and, and report, um, that's an important important control. The other is making sure that our systems are adequately patched. That's also mm-hmm. important in the case of uh, in the case of not patch, I believe yeah. the MS17-10 uh, patch yes. for the vulnerability, the SMB2 vulnerability, had been available for quite a while. Yes. It's not like it was a zero day or it yes. was something that you know you only had um, a week or two to patch. You actually had uh, quite a bit of time to patch, um, which on the one hand sounds easy. But the moment you multiply that by tens of thousands of devices across many locations with different levels of networking, and sometimes those systems have come together through a series of mergers and acquisitions, um, it's not very difficult for one or two or three or four systems to fall through the cracks. That's something that we're very hyper-focused on is how do we make sure we get to 100% because the thing that makes our our field both challenging and nerve-wracking is anything less than 100% is just not good enough. It's true. just takes one. just takes one. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. You had mentioned phishing, so I wanted to touch a little bit more on the on the phishing. So um, I read, again, some statistics about uh, how phishing is 90, 90% or uh, phishing attacks start, I think, 90% of the time um, yeah. uh, make their way into uh, any organization that way. Um, but, you know, whatever that, whatever that percentage is, I think we can argue about whether that 90% or less than 90%, it doesn't matter. Um, phishing is clearly the way that they get in. They're, again, capitalizing on the human nature part of, uh, of what we do for a living. It's hard to secure humans, right? Yeah. Um, so 
do you feel that the employees are the weakest link? I mean, you mentioned uh, the scale, you mentioned all the all the separate systems, but do you feel like humans are the the weakest link of that supply chain essentially? You know, the way the way I think about it is um, humans have the potential to become the single strongest control in defending ourselves against our cyber adversaries. Mm -hmm. And so we put all our efforts into how do we move them from the liability side of the balance sheet to the asset side of the, of the balance sheet. And so we've got strong belief that our, our humans and the people, the users in our environment, the employees, the contractors, the, the partners that have access to our systems, if we, if we do this right, they absolutely can be a pretty significant asset for us. And, and that's, that's what we do. Um, you know, one of the things that we focused on is over the last three, four years, as, as we've really focused on building a stronger culture, one of information protection across the enterprise, is we focused on the why. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes what happens with cybersecurity awareness programs is they simply tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily tell you why you need to do it. Yes. And there's a really strong parallel in the healthcare world. And I, I have this conversation oftentimes as I meet primary care physicians and I ask them if your, every single one of your patients ate healthy, they exercised and they got the right amount of sleep, how many patients would you have left? And the answer is very few. Yeah. It turns out in the world of cyber, it's identical. The things that we need people to do mm -hmm. are fairly easy. Be mm -hmm. careful what you click on. Patch your systems. Be careful hygiene, about yeah. cyber hygiene. Yes, yes. Um, password hygiene. Yeah. Be careful about what websites you uh, you, you go to and mm -hmm. who you send information to. There's nothing about it that's complex or difficult. It's yeah. things that we've known for a very long time. However, just because we know about them doesn't mean we'll do them. Everyone knows that smoking kills you, people still smoke. <laughs> Everyone knew that 20 years ago yes. and still 50% of the US population was made up of smokers. And so, you know, when we talk about security awareness, mm -hmm. I think therein lies the problem right there. Mm -hmm. And we often think about security awareness as being the ultimate objective. I would offer, we've already, we already have security awareness. Yeah. Everyone knows what the right thing to do is when it comes to cyber, just like everyone knows in order to remain healthy, what you need to do, you need to eat healthy, you need to exercise well, and you need to get good sleep. That's all you need to do. Yeah. And if you want to go extra, maybe don't drink and don't smoke and don't do drugs, yeah. right? But that's all you need to do. So the question is not one of awareness. The question is one of behavior change. Yeah. And so the big discipline that we've tried to infuse into the cybersecurity practice is one around change management, not change management in the ITIL and IT yes. production and release management sense, but change management as in the people and organizational behavior sense of what does it take to get people to change? Mm. Just because I tell you to do something does not mean you'll do it. Mm. There's a series of you know, science-based things that we need to do. And if we do them, there's a greater likelihood than you'll, that you'll change than simply me telling you to do the same thing over and over yes, and absolutely. over again. Absolutely. And so one of, the, one of the strongest things that we could do there is one, explain to you why you should change and change in this case, change your behavior to have a bent towards security. And the second is we should make sure that there's some consequences if you don't change. Yes. And if we so, do those two things, there's a pretty good likelihood that we'll get people to do exactly what we want them to do, which should be in their interest, in the customer's interest, and the enterprise's interest. I like the change-based uh, approach, uh, approach. That's really good. It's incentivizing, um, but then also the consequence part of it, right? Yes. Super important. Um, so are you doing a phishing simulation? Like how, how, how did you go about, if you haven't already, how have you gone about um, actually instituting something like that? Sure. So, so we have, you know, for the last several years, we have been sending out uh, phishing tests. Mm -hmm. And initially people were not very happy. Yes. And every now and then I, I still get stopped in the elevator lobbies and yes, the cafeteria <laughs> saying, you know, thank you. Our, your team is sending those out. Are you sending them? I'm like, I'm not personally sending those out. But yes, it's my team. I take, I take full, full yeah. ownership of those. Mm -hmm. and, and it's helping because some of these are uh, some of these are pretty serious. We mm -hmm. had one in which we said uh, we have withdrawn some money from your bank account because we mistakenly wired more money than we actually owed you. <laughs> 
And so you can imagine people can have a very stressful yes. response to yes. that is I was expecting, you know, you, you gave me $2,000 and now you're going to yes. withdraw $800. Well, maybe I don't have $800 for you to yeah. withdraw from the account because I've already spent it. And so, you know, that was not good, getting the reactions from mm -hmm. different folks and uh, people that had legitimate, uh, legitimate re reactions to that. But I had to sit down with those folks and with my team to say, mm -hmm. look, these are, we're emulating the, re the, exactly. the real threat actors. We're not coming up with these. We're mm -hmm. not trying to dupe you. We're actually taking real fishes that are out there in the wild. And those are the ones that we're leveraging to send to you. So you're much better off if you're going to fall for one of these, to fall for one that's a simulated mm -hmm. phishing email versus a, versus a real one. And it's much better to learn in practice than to learn when, uh, when, the, odds are, when the odds are real. Absolutely. I 100% yeah. agree. And the amount of times I get stopped in a lobby and someone says, I didn't fall for that one. Yes. Is awesome. It is. It is. <laughs> and then, and then you know, the other thing that I, I would I would grapple with is when an executive would stop me and said, Omar, I have to confess. I'm like, let me guess. <laughs> like, yes, I clicked on it. I'm so sorry. I can't believe it. I know. Like, I'm so embarrassed. I'm yeah. so ashamed. And so I grappled with that and I grappled. I, I said, I, this is like, it's not easy for me to yes. hear my, one of my peers succumbing to, to a phishing email. Yeah. And so I have a very simple solution for that. Anytime something happens like that, I say to them, here's the rule. If you don't click on it, I'm very happy because you did the right thing and you, keep this, uh, you kept us safe. If you do click on it, you owe me lunch. There you go. <laughs> and so either way, I get to celebrate. Do you get to pick the place? I get to pick the place. Awesome. Very smart. I'll yeah. add that to my incentives yeah. program. Um, so speaking of other employees, um, what about your own cybersecurity people? So, uh, you know, we clearly in cybersecurity have a workforce problem. Uh, so tell me a little bit more about how you go about recruiting people um, in this competitive environment. Where, where are you looking? Sure. Give me some insights there. Sure. So, you know, if we, we think about talent that it's, uh, it's a three-step process. Mm -hmm. The first step is to to attract them mm -hmm. um, for for new talent, mm -hmm. um, and in parallel for the folks that are already there. It's making sure that there are strong development programs in place that mm -hmm. are aligned with uh, with what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. Primarily, not as much. I mean, yes, we care about the objectives of the security program, but it's got to start with the people's Absolutely. objectives. Mm -hmm. So, if their objective is to do something that there isn't space or time or priority for within our program, mm -hmm. we want to find them the place that they are going to be successful. And sometimes that means me actually referring them to other organizations where we think that they're going to be able to do. The the best work of their careers. And the last piece is, is the retention piece. So what actually keeps them there? Yeah. And what we find is what keeps them there, a, a big part of it is, is culture. A bi another big part of it, and, and Gallup just did, uh, recently did a study on this, that it's the manager. So 70% of the reason that people like the jobs that they're in mm -hmm. is because their manager is someone that they think really cares about them, is keeping them engaged, is working on their development. And it turns out it's simple things like the manager has a meaningful conversation Absolutely. with them at least once time. a week. Yeah. And so we've put a tremendous focus on developing um, our managers and our leaders. In fact, we do this across all of IT and all of security. In fact, we have a session coming up tomorrow. Yeah. And it's our quarterly session where we take every single people manager across IT and security, mm -hmm. so well over 200 people, and they get together in a central location and we spend an entire day learning and sharing best practices as it relates to leadership. There's no IT, there's no technology, yeah. there's no vendors. We're only talking about leadership. And so once a quarter, four times a year, we, we spend time focusing on that. That's and our important. goal is that or our, our thought is if we if we grow and develop our people managers into becoming the best managers we can get that truly care about the success of the people, then the people will do the best job of their careers and they'll implement the best security practices and sustain the ones that we already have and the enterprise will be secure and our customers will be will be very happy. And it turns out that that works. Yes. And so when I started this journey, the attrition on my on my team for people that had been in the organization for less than a year was 42%. Wow. That meant I was working really, really hard to build our brand, get out there, yes, talk to people. Course. And yeah. I was figuring out how to attract the talent. Yeah. And then they'd get there and they'd say, what the <laughs> hell did I 
<laughs> get myself into. Yeah, yeah. And then half of them would leave. Yeah. And so I said, well, it does not matter because if half of the people that I tried really, really hard to recruit leave, then there's no way we're going to be successful. Yeah. So I've got to find out why people don't like it here, fix that. And if I fix that, then we're going to be in better shape. So we spent two years focusing on the culture, getting the right leaders in place. Yeah. And so, you know, the last time I looked at that statistic, we had exactly zero people leave after 12 months of being here. Wow, congratulations. And so that's, that's something that, you yeah. know, we have to constantly do because if we stop paying attention yeah. to that, we'll very quickly end up back agree. where yeah. where we were. So we've got a very, very strong people, a uh, strong focus on on people and making sure that they are, we're, we're giving them the opportunities that are in line with what they consider to be the best work of their career. That's amazing. So you got to bring your whole self to work, right? You have to yeah. bring your whole Absolutely. self to work. That's amazing. So tell me more about your security team. How big, you know, what's, yeah, how is so, it different than Verizon, let's say? Sure. You know, so so my uh, my security team, the security team at Highmark Health is, mm -hmm. is about 160 full-time employees mm -hmm. and probably another you know, 50 to 70 contractors and those uh, those scale up and down yeah. depending on, on the projects that, on. Yes. that we have. Yeah. You know, we've got, uh, we break it down into three different areas, which I have a director for each. There's a director for cyber operations, mm -hmm. which is where we have um, architecture and engineering and mm -hmm. identity and access management mm -hmm. and the security operations center, which includes threat management and mm -hmm. incident response and uh, data protection. And then I've got a director that looks after the governance, risk, and compliance yes. functions. Okay. Um, and we actually moved vulnerability, what's traditionally vulnerability management, we renamed that vulnerability governance mm -hmm. because we realized we're actually not managing the vulnerabilities. Yes. <laughs> the technology teams are managing yes. the vulnerabilities. All we're doing is the governance around it. And so we thought that the GRC uh, GRC was a much better place to put it, and uh, that's where the medical device program okay. lives. That's where the access review program lives. The risk management program lives there, mm -hmm. which is uh, heavily based on FAIR, which is a mechanism for for quantifying yep. risk. We've been on that journey for the last couple yep. of years, and uh, that's also where all things related to controls governance, uh, which is what we used to call compliance several mm -hmm. years ago, and we realized all compliance is is a set of controls. Yep. And we like controls and we want to make sure we've got the right set of controls, not too many, not too few. We yep. like Goldilocks. Um, <laughs> and so the controls governance group uh, focuses on what's the right set of controls. The, the, the primary industry framework that we leverage there is the high trust common security framework yep. because what that does is it takes all of the different frameworks and it harmonizes them together so we don't have to play uh, interpreter and crosswalker from yes. HIPAA to GDPR yeah. to CCPA to PCI to the Pennsylvania data privacy requirements yeah. to uh, NIST and mm -hmm. We don't want to do that. We just want one thing, and we want someone else to take care of the crosswalk. So we've aligned to the, the high trust common security framework. Um, so those are the first two areas, which is cyber operations and GRC. The third area is maybe one that's that's slightly unique, and that's something that we call strategy, execution, and sustainability. Mm -hmm. And much of our secret sauce is, uh, is in this space. Mm -hmm. And so what people would typically call cybersecurity awareness, uh, that term is actually banned at Highmark because <laughs> okay. I said to my team, I say to people, is talking about, yes, we do cybersecurity awareness, mm -hmm. that is something we do, but that's simply a tool. Our ultimate goal is to change behavior mm, or is to implement change in a sustainable manner. So it's all about sustainability and it's about change execution. And you know, talking about cyber awareness is like saying the GRC team does Excel. Do they use Excel all day long? Yeah. Absolutely. Do they send emails? Do they review right. them? Do they update them? They do a lot of Excel. Mm. We don't call them the Excel team. <laughs> so why do we call the user behavior the team the yeah. awareness team? Yeah. Yes, they do awareness and yes, they do training, yeah. but they're not the training team, just like GRC isn't the Excel team yeah. and cyber ops isn't the Splunk team, <laughs> right? So you, we don't name teams after the tools they use. We name them after the outcomes they achieve. And awareness is absolutely yeah. not the outcome. Awareness is a tool. Behavior change is the outcome, the outcome that uh, that we seek. So we have that team is dominated by people that understand change. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had uh, people in we have people in there that have gone to 
uh, various industry change uh, trainings and yep. have certifications and in fact are certified to actually train others on it. So the security program, we actually lead training sessions to train IT and the larger enterprise on change. So we mm. mint what we call Chain Sherpas through a multi-month program. And uh, so we're becoming a little bit of an, a center for excellence for, for change management for the, uh, for the enterprise. That's great. That's really cutting yeah. edge stuff, actually. Because yeah. at the end of the day, if we look at what we need to do, is everything just boils down to we need people to do the right thing. Absolutely. And that means we need them to change their behavior and sustain it. And yes, there's a lot of technology and controls yes. and compliance and all that, but it all boils down to if everyone did the right thing, yeah. we would life would be a lot easier. So, so yes. change management is, is very much central to what we do. That's fantastic. Let's move away from people for a minute and okay. go back to the medical devices. Back to medical I'm devices. Fascinated. Yes. I'm not, again, I've, I'm not that, that kind of CISO. So um, obviously they're under your purview. Is that, is that right? So yes. the medical devices themselves, so they're connected. Um, Tell me a little bit more about um, that heightened responsibility that you have um, because you're dealing with people's lives. Yes. Um, and how, how you just go about protecting them. Yeah. Um, so there are – there's two different situations that we break medical devices into. Mm -hmm. One is the medical devices we already have in the environment. What do we do to protect them? Mm -hmm. And the second is any new medical devices that we're planning on bringing into the environment. Yeah, you mentioned, yeah. So I look yeah. at the first situation as we've been digging holes for many years <laughs> and how do we fill those up? Yeah. And the second is – We've got people with shovels that are ready to dig more. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we should take all the shovels away yes. and stop digging. And then we can go figure out how do we fill up all, all of these holes. So for, for that second situation where we would want to make sure we're not digging any new holes, we've got a program in place where we partner with finance and with sourcing and legal and enterprise risk mm. to make sure that uh, we've got the appropriate scrutiny for all new medical devices coming into the environment and we're clear on exactly what the requirements and, uh, and expectations are. For the ones that we already have in the environment, we sort of started with, can we find the low-hanging fruit in terms of the ones that have an issue? We don't necessarily need to know about every single medical device. We don't necessarily even need to know about every single vulnerability. And what we need to do is find the most vulnerable ones and mm. go fix them. Mm. And so traditionally what security teams do is we take a waterfall approach, mm -hmm. which is let's go do all of step one, yes. and then six months later we'll do all of step two, mm -hmm. and then a year later we'll finally get to step three. So mm -hmm. if step one is discovery, step two is analysis and triage, and step three is remediation, that means it could be a full year before we actually reduce any risk. And so we're spending a lot of time, we're really busy, but we've reduced exactly zero risk. So the approach that we've taken is one of let's be agile. Let's go identify something mm. and let's go fix it. Mm. So instead of taking year a year to fix the first vulnerability, let's fix a ton of them in the first month or two. Mm. And then let's go find more and fix them. Let's go find more and fix them. And so a lot of programs focus on let's go get the best discovery tool out there yeah. because we want to make sure there is not a device we miss. You know. In theory, that sounds good, but in practice, it's probably the exact opposite of what you should do. Because if you already know about a thousand vulnerabilities, and let's say you're missing 200, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> because you're not going to fix 1,200 before you fix 200. Mm. Go fix 200 and the next 200. Yes. And then when you your problem is, I don't have a big enough pile of vulnerabilities to fix, go invest in a discovery tool. There we go. But if your problem is, I have too many vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. By getting a better tool to identify more vulnerabilities, you're not solving your problem. You're just exacerbating. Yeah, you're adding on to it. Yeah, yeah. Very good philosophy. Yeah. Um, so, and, and and I'd say you know maybe the 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 other part of it is um, then working outside of our four walls and partnering with the med device vendors. Yeah, and good. there's a part of us which would feel really really good if the regulators just took care of it mm -hmm. and made sure that the med device vendors had the appropriate security controls. So when we plugged them in, we knew exactly what to do to configure mm -hmm. them securely. Mm -hmm. And um, if we we followed those clear and instructions, things would be good. I think we're far away from uh, from living in, in that utopian mm -hmm. reality. But until we get there, we probably need to have some of a, uh, a market-based solution. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, a regulatory solution would be good. 
It doesn't seem to be happening. That seems mm -hmm. to be moving at a, at a glacial pace. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, what we can do is work with other like-minded providers and say, can we work together with the vendors and come up with a very specific set of not guidelines, but requirements. requirements Part yeah. of the challenge is the vendors look at what comes from regulators as guidelines because that's literally what they're called. They're called guidelines. Yeah. They're not actually hard requirements, and but we can contractually obligate them to certain requirements, but do it in such a way that they don't feel like we're imposing them on them, but we work together to say, let's come up with something that feels very reasonable, very attainable. Part of the challenge in defense of med device vendors is if they've got 10 different hospital customers, every single one of them has a different set of requirements. Mm -hmm. So part of the onus is on us as a group of hospital systems to come up with a clear, simple, and single set of requirements that we can sort of start to uh, start to position as a as a standard for for how med devices ought to be secured out of the box. Very good, very good. Um, so let's switch to you a little bit. <laughs> so given the the jump you've made, what advice can you give others um, that would like to become a CISO and why? Um, and what should they be doing now so that they can um, acclimate uh, the experience and knowledge to become a CISO one day? Sure. Um, you know one. One of the um, one of the the mantras I live by is uh, better is always better, and so there's no perfect in there mm -hmm. because as I look back over the six years that I've been a CISO, and we've had hundreds of projects and hundreds of plans to go with them, not in one case did we have a perfect plan, mm -hmm. and so to me the empirical evidence would suggest. I, I don't know how to do perfect. So the only logical conclusion then is I just need to embrace imperfect. Mm. And so the goal is, can we just be a little bit better? And if mm. we focus on being better, and internally the term that we've coined is uh, relentless incrementalism, which uh, I actually stole from <laughs> Brian great. Parker, our chief quality officer for our hospital system, that's it. So if every day we focus on being a teeny tiny bit better, at some point we'll look back and say, wow, we made a lot of progress, one drop, one small mm -hmm. footstep, uh, footstep at a time. And so here's how we define relentless incrementalism. We start with a plan. We know we've never come up with a plan that's perfect. So it's not just any plan. Mm -hmm. It has to be an imperfect plan because those are the only ones we know how to create. So you start with an imperfect plan and then you execute an imperfect plan. And the thing that we know that happens as an outcome of executing 100% of imperfect plans is that you make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So then the third step of the process is make mistakes. Mm -hmm. The only caveat there is it's not any mistake, it's make new mistakes. Because if you're making the same mistakes over and over again, then chances are you're not learning. You're not learning. But if you're making new mistakes every time, that's okay. You make the new mistakes, then you make the imperfect plan slightly less imperfect, relentless incrementalism, yeah. and then you go back to executing the imperfect plan. Mm -hmm. And we just do that over and over and over again. And we make a ton of mistakes along the way, but we get better. And so part of you know what, what's worked for me personally and uh, the culture that we've tried to establish across the security program is one that says it's okay to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. It's not okay to make the same mistakes. It's not okay to not learn from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. But when we make mistakes, let's do after action reviews. Let's make sure we've got lessons learned and let's let's move on and make sure that we're better as a result of, of making those mistakes. So I'd say, you know, my advice to CISOs would be, um, you have to be someone that loves learning. Things change all the time. If it's AI, yes. if it's cloud, Absolutely. if it's med devices. And if you're not willing to say, I don't know anything about this topic mm. and I'm going to go spend two, three, four, five months uh, with the appropriate level of humility and I'm going to go figure out how to learn. And so you have to have a very, very dominating learning, learning mindset. Yes. If you have that, you're going to be okay. And then you have to have the humility coupled with that learning mindset to mm. know I'm smart enough to know I don't know most things. Yes. But I know who to ask. I know what questions to ask. I know that I'm going to be able to get better. I know how to coach my team. Yeah. And if we, if you do that, we'll, you'll be, you'll be just fine because the pace of change is too great, and aiming for perfect is definitely a losing battle. Wow, that's great. Thank you so much, Omar. This has been fantastic. So again, this has been Ask the CISO interview brought to you by Fortinet. Thanks for joining us today. No problem. Thank you. 